few special individuals are made for their time. One such person was W. Michael Hoffman, Hyken Professor of Business and Professional Ethics and the founding executive director of the W. Michael Hoffman Center of Business Ethics at Bentley University, who, after a brief illness, died at the age of 75 on December 6, 2018, just a few months before his scheduled retirement. Mike was a pioneer in the field of business ethics, a field that he helped define. At each inflection point in the development of business ethics, Mike was there, saw what was needed, stepped up, and made a difference for the better. Michael Hoffman grew up in Paris, Kentucky, where he attended Paris High School. He received his BA in 1965 from Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, and spent six years as an assistant professor at Hiram College, two years after receiving his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Bentley, which had become a college offering a bachelor's degree in 1971, could hardly have imagined what a treasure it was getting in hiring Mike, whose specialty was Kant's theory of knowledge as chair of the philosophy department. Having joined a school known primarily for its business degrees, Mike immediately saw the need for courses in business ethics and under a national endowment for the humanities grant, he developed such courses before there was any such academic area. He understood the importance of institutions and so founded one of the first centers specifically for business ethics in 1976. He had a vision of business ethics and what it could do that went far beyond academic teaching and research, although he engaged in and promoted and facilitated both on the part of others. The purpose of business ethics, as he saw it, was to change how business was done. He saw more clearly than most of those who had a hand in forming the newly emerging field of business ethics that to effect change, one had to engage business people in the enterprise as equals. From the start, the Bentley Center extended a welcoming hand to those in business who were already running ethical companies and Mike found willing partners. The 1960s was the decade of countercultural revolution, where many people, especially our youth, were protesting the moral legitimacy of the Vietnam War and demonstrating concerns over the pollution of the natural environment. Growing from this revolution of the 1960s and early 1970s, the social regulatory movement began. This movement saw the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission. In 1973, our nation was shocked by the Watergate scandal, which led to the resignation of our president and revelations of illegal corporate campaign contributions to the Nixon re-election effort. I think um, the catalyst for me, as I think it probably was for a lot of people, was Watergate. Um, I think the nation was shocked uh, about Watergate. Uh, I, I never will forget listening to the Senate Watergate Investigation Committee mm -hmm. and having either Sam Irving or someone ask the question to John Dean, who was then uh, the counsel to President Nixon as to whether they had ever asked the question as to whether what they were doing was morally right, ethically right. And Dean replied that the question of ethics never 
arose in the Oval Office discussions uh, concerning Watergate and the aftermath of Watergate. And I think people just sort of sat back and said, whoa, you mean you never even asked the question as to whether what you were doing was ethically appropriate or not? And I think that shocked a lot of people. About six months after Nixon left office, uh, the Lockheed Corporation uh, came under investigation by the United States Congress. About four or five years previous to that, uh, they had been bailed out of bankruptcy by a government guarantee. And in fact, in the process, the government had concluded that Lockheed had engaged in pervasive, systemic, global bribing of government officials worldwide and actually imposed a federal monitor uh, to oversee the implementation of their ethics program. Uh, in the process, they also discovered that this was a pervasive condition among businesses everywhere. And 400 companies came forward admitting making massive government bribes under an amnesty agreement at the time. In 1977, we passed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the first government to criminalize the payment of bribes to foreign officials. And for many years, decades, in fact, the only country to even prosecute, however nominally. Uh, in fact, today, however, in the last three and a half years, uh, there have been more prosecutions under FCPA than we had in the previous 35 years combined. And it speaks to the very transparent world that we live in, a place where there are no secrets, there's no place to hide. Everybody knows what's going on. And this is the new world, the new era that we are involved in. This was the context for where the center was born. Over the years, the center has clearly established itself as the preeminent ethics center in the world. In 1992, Mike served as the founding executive director of the Ethics Officer Association, which morphed into the Ethics and Compliance Officer Association, and later merged with the uh, Ethics Resource Center to form the Ethics Compliance Initiative. Uh, Mike also co-founded and served as president of the Society for Business Ethics, of which I've been a longtime member uh, myself. And he served on the advisory board of the Federal Sentencing Guidelines for Organizations. Hoffman, a young philosophy professor at Bentley College, approached these opportunities from a philosophical level rather than from the buzz of the daily headlines. He knew the current events were the catalysts that got our attention and were not the deeper roots of the crisis. It was a wonderful discipline that sharpened our intellectual tools, he said, but seemed to resist planting any seeds from which crops could grow for those tools to actually harvest. Hoffman had plans to change all that. When I came to Bentley as chairman of the philosophy department in 1974, I started thinking almost immediately as to how to get philosophy more interconnected with the business mission of Bentley. So I wrote a proposal to the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it seemed almost overnight when I got a rejection <laughs> that said, you have not gotten the grant. We've never heard of business ethics. Uh, and so I was persistent and decided to make an appointment with the director of programs at the NEH. And I flew to Washington. And uh, when I went into his office, I mean, I'm 32 years old at the time, untenured wondering what in the heck am I doing in Washington, D.C. I grew up in Kentucky. This is a strange place. In this big office, and I sat down in front of the director of programs, and he told me, he said, I'm sorry, I don't know what I can do for you, but your proposal was not accepted. Uh, and I said, well, I wonder if I could see the evaluations of my proposal because it might help me decide how to rephrase it, reshape it, to reapply for the grant. Well, this took him back. I could see it in his face. He said, you want to see the evaluations of your proposal? I said, yes, sir, if that's OK. He said, well, you know, I've never had to show the evaluations of a proposal to the NEH to anyone before. And I said, uh, uh, yeah, 
I know. I didn't know. I said, okay. So he, he rang his secretary and, and said, would you bring in uh, Mr. Hoffman's uh, evaluations to his proposal? So she did, and we both looked at them, and they were like, no. Um, uh, this is an oxymoron, isn't it? Um, and I've never heard of it. That, that's all that was on them. So the director was terribly embarrassed, and he said so. He said, I am embarrassed by these evaluations, and this will never happen again. And he said, I want you to reapply. And so I left the office, and I came back to Bentley, and I did reapply, and we got the grant. And I wondered, why did he say that he had to show me those evaluations which he had never had to show before? And I finally found out that an amendment to the Freedom of Information Act had just been passed called the Privacy Act. And the Privacy Act said that any individual had a right to see any information that related to them that was held by a federal agency. And that was passed about two or three months before I went down to see the director. <laughs> so I am convinced that business ethics started at Bentley due to the hand of God and the Privacy Act. <laughs> The Center for Business Ethics was intended to and successfully became inclusive. It welcomed different perspectives. First and foremost, the Center endeavored to develop reciprocity between theory and practice, scholars and practitioners, thinkers and doers. There had been an unnatural animosity and distrust between those dimensions and groups, and Hoffman deemed their coming together to learn and to find common ground as essential. Mike Hoffman summarized this coming together as follows. I believe that, deep down, both groups respect, even envy, the other. It will probably always be an unsettled marriage, but we must make the tension healthy and creative. The center continuously sought out win-win partnering relationships and always considered Bentley its most important stakeholder. Institutes like CBE must recognize that their success depends on identifying a home base of support and then partner with that base appropriately. This could be called cooperative inreach. I should also say something very briefly uh, about the in-reach efforts of the center within Bentley. Most of our work over the past 20 years, to be sure, has been a lot of outreach. Outreach to corporations, outreach to other universities, outreach to the public. I spend, I don't know how many hours a week talking to the press about ethics issues. Um, and we, we, we feel that is partly what pays for our supper, so to speak, here at the college, because we've managed to put Bentley on the map more than it would be otherwise. But I should also say something about what we do within Bentley. We uh, sponsor a committee called uh, Teaching Ethics Across the Curriculum. That committee is constantly thinking up ideas and uh, programs to drive ethics throughout the courses at Bentley for the students. We run what is called the Gadfly program and have for the last five years, where every May, uh, eight professors, usually business professors, but there have been some arts and sciences professors, uh, have a two-week workshop. Every year these days, we're graduating more than 1,500 business professionals who are newly minted, both undergrad and graduates, who are joining global conglomerates, startups, Wall Street firms, nonprofits, professional and financial services firms, and others. And our goal is that every single one of them leaves this campus 
knowing the full value of business practices that fully embody the goals, the vision, um, the beliefs of the CBE. Mike, we are all incredibly better. The world is better. The marketplace is far better for what you and your team have done for 40 years. The Center for Business Ethics also sought cooperative outreach with different people and organizations by developing partnerships with initiatives and other institutes. Under Mike's direction, the Bentley Center had started a week-long course managing ethics in organizations for people interested in becoming corporate ethics officers and for those who already had such obligations and wanted to learn best practices and share their experiences, successes, and failures. The course is still offered annually. Mike recruited instructors from both academia and business, and the Bentley Center has trained over a thousand business people extending the influence of business ethics throughout the business world, both here and abroad. Mike did not stop there. He knew he had to reach more business executives. What better way than to have successful CEOs present their experiences running their firms in an ethical way? In 1998, the Bentley Center inaugurated a biannual CEO lecture series, now the Raytheon Lectureship and Business Ethics Series, funded by Raytheon. Mike did not forget students, and in 1999, the center started a lecture series known as the Verizon Professorship in Business Ethics Series, funded by Verizon, which brings a noted academic not only to give a lecture, but also to meet with classes and present a workshop for faculty and staff over a several day period. Lectures in both series are published and distributed free of charge to over 6,500 academic and business leaders including all of the Fortune 1000 companies. It's a place where thought leaders uh, come home and they gather, and we have the visiting scholars, we have the visiting Verizon professors, uh, we have the Raytheon uh, leadership, a uh, lectureship in business ethics. An executive fellow is a uh, individual who has license or permission or uh, the privilege to be associated with the center to do their own independent research. Uh, hopefully we give back more to the center than we get from it uh, by our activities, by our lecturing, by our publications, by the other involvements in the outside world that we bring to the center. Uh, and I like to think that we bring the center to the outside world as well. We're located all over the country, uh, but have a great uh, affiliation and loyalty uh, in promoting the center. Michael Hoffman and the center always looked for ways to be effective, especially in anticipating trends. Capitalizing on opportunity was best demonstrated in the founding and sustained efforts of the center's conferences. Under Mike's leadership, the center ran one of the first business ethics conferences in 1977. And it was notable for the mix of government officials corporate CEOs, and academics. It has since then run 10 such conferences and published and distributed the proceedings. Let's have the first national conference on business ethics, <clears throat> which is what we did in 1977. It was an amazing success. We had, and I don't know how we got all of these people, but we had the Speaker of the House, of representatives, Tip O'Neill, come and talk about ethics and government. We had Elliot Richardson, who was uh, the former attorney general. You may remember, I don't know if you will or not, but he was uh, canned by President Nixon because he wouldn't uh, do what President Nixon said in terms of firing the special prosecutor, the special Watergate, Watergate prosecutor Archibald Cox, 
And Richardson says, no, I won't fire him, Mr. President. And Mr. President said, well, you're fired. So uh, Elliot Richardson was, uh, was out, but then when he spoke at our conference, was then ambassador of the seas, and was only about a year and a half after that incident. So in, in demonstrating that kind of integrity under pressure, we thought he would be a great speaker to talk at the conference. And he came. We had Daniel Bell from Harvard, a renowned sociologist. We had Alistair McIntyre, who was one of the foremost uh, leading uh, philosophical thinkers uh, in the country. We had uh, Gallup poll, did a special poll on business ethics uh, for uh, that particular conference. And we had um, executives from seven or eight uh, corporations come, many of them CEOs and presidents. And this was all in a day and a half. I mean, it was a star-studded lineup. Well, consequently, we had many, many people that came to the college to, to listen to that conference. In fact, when O'Neill and Richardson spoke, we had the auditorium completely filled with 600 people. And uh, we were in every national media outlet in the country for that conference. I think it was a combination of the speakers that we had and the fact that uh, business ethics was such an oxymoronic kind of thing. You know, you just didn't put business and ethics together then. At least most people did, didn't. And if you did, people joked about it as if it was, weren't two terms that should go together. Now, obviously, um, we've been trying to change that over the past 20 years. The center has an extensive library of books, journals, and other materials in business ethics and welcomes scholars from around the world who wish to do research in business ethics, utilizing the center's library and associating with the faculty at Bentley. And what's developed here now in the Center for Business Ethics is a comprehensive library of books, audio tapes, videotapes, and, and otherwise of uh, best practices that companies can point to. Uh, so we have models for the types of organizational decisions, the types of incentive systems that we can put into our companies and make better and creative decisions. Mike not only fostered and encouraged work by others, but published 16 books, often with others in both academia and business, and authored or co-authored more than a hundred articles, which appeared in such scholarly journals as Business Ethics Quarterly and Journal of Business Ethics, and in business, trade, and popular publications. In 1998, he and Bob Frederick took over the Business and Society Review as the Bentley Center's journal with Bob as editor, and arranged for Blackwell, now Wiley, to publish it on a quarterly basis. Mike brought business ethics issues to public attention through over 60 feature interviews in such outlets as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Washington Post. His expertise was widely sought. He gave over 150 lectures and conference presentations, and he has been quoted on business ethics topics in dozens of newspapers and magazines, including Business Week, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, USA Today, and The Wall Street Journal. In 1978, there were a number of more or less isolated philosophy faculty members working on business ethics. Cognizant of the importance of organizations, and when contacted by Tom Donaldson, he jumped at the idea of forming a society for those engaged in the emerging field. He and Tom invited three others to join them in starting what was to become the Society for Business Ethics, known as SBE. Today, the society is thriving with members from 20 countries. 
when in 1991, the United States issued the federal sentencing guidelines for organizations, it offered a possible reduction of millions of dollars in fines if a firm could show it had a structure in place overseen by a high-level executive, later called an ethics officer, that included ethics training, monitoring, and enforcement. This was a new concept for most companies, which were uncertain how to proceed. Mike, together with two colleagues at Bentley, Bob Frederick and Ed Petrie, and Craig Dreilinger, from the Dryford Group, saw a need and responded by inviting 15 corporate executives to share what they were doing in their corporations. The meeting was so successful that they formed the Business Ethics Officer Association. Members chose the Bentley Center for Business Ethics as the facilitating institution with Mike as the first executive director. I knew there were what we call ethics officers out there in companies. But I also knew that they didn't know each other. They would call the center, ask for some advice, ask for certain kinds of materials. But they wouldn't really know uh, each other. In 1991, Mike Hoffman and Bob Frederick from the Center for Business Ethics and Craig Dreilinger from the Dryford Group had the idea of bringing together managers of ethics and compliance programs. And this was the first time that they had gotten together to talk about their common problems, their shared solutions, and to begin to discuss the possibility of having an association to continue that dialogue. And they spent a day and a half together, talked about their various programs and uh, objectives. And at the end of the day and a half, they said, uh, Mike, you really can't let this die. We need to continue this kind of networking. So we started what is called the Ethics Officer Association. And that stayed at Bentley for about four or five years. Uh, we started out with a handful of corporations. And now that, that organization is a national organization with over 500 members. You have to be a practicing ethics officer to be a member. And it represents over 400 corporations I would say two-thirds of which are Fortune 500 uh, corporations. In 1998, SBE published the first issue of Business Ethics Quarterly. Mike was on the SBE executive committee that established the journal, on the editorial advisory board at its inception, and then on the editorial board until 2005. Over time, the Ethics Officer Association changed its name to the Ethics and Compliance Officer Association and later joined forces with the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, or ECI. You have to be an ethics officer to be a member. There are about 750 members, and its membership is still growing. It's not a stretch to say that the Center for Business Ethics and Michael Hoffman led the way in these cooperative efforts. There are corporations out there that have started ethics programs and have professed their um, concern about developing an ethical culture. And yet, what they do is to write a code of ethics, usually from top corporate people, send it out to their employees, but don't follow it up with any kind of infrastructure or any kind of training program for employees. In fact, today, more than ever before, they are uh, necessary uh, companions. Uh, you, you, I think good ethics is good business, and without uh, good ethics, a business is uh, operating in a very perilous environment. Uh, because if customers don't trust you, if investor, investors don't trust you, if employees are not proud to work for you, then you've got problems anyway, aside from all of the liabilities that the law may bring down upon you. Uh, trust is what drives business, and ethics is 
sort of the engine of trust today. It may be true that business ethics was birthed in the United States, but it has gained firm ground around the world. The global growth in business ethics has even become large enough to sustain organizational meetings. This can be seen in the development of the European Business Ethics Network, which has held annual conferences for over a decade. Particularly in Europe, an organization started called um, uh, the uh, European Business Ethics Network, EBAN, it's called. And the European Business Ethics Network has grown. Just... They came and talked with people who had already started doing this mm -hmm. so that they could, as corporations do, benchmark with us, find out what was working, what are the issues sure. that we're finding okay. uh, important. And that, that network, the European Business Ethics Network, has been very successful. It has a conference every year in a different European city. And I have been probably out of the, say, 12 conferences they've had, I myself have probably attended seven or eight, and it's grown substantially each year. Mike's untiring and groundbreaking work in the field of business ethics was widely recognized both nationally and internationally, and he received numerous awards. In 2007, he was proclaimed Humanist of the Year by the Ethical Society in Boston. His other awards include a Lifetime Achievement Award for a career of outstanding service to the field of business ethics from the Society for Business Ethics in 2011, and a Lifetime Achievement Award in the field of ethics and compliance from the Ethics and Compliance Officer Association in 2012. I know, Mike, you feel the vast, vast amount of pride in what you've done for Bentley and the world. Um, the impact, your imprint is permanent. Um, the depths of the respect and admiration for you, and I know you also feel the tremendous love in this room tonight. So, without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, to read the following citation. Whereas the Center for Business Ethics is celebrating its 40th anniversary and is one of the world's oldest and most highly regarded institutes for research and education in the field of business ethics, serving as a major catalyst in the development and success of the business ethics movement, both in the United States and around the globe. Whereas the Board of Trustees and the President wish to recognize W. Michael Hoffman for his insight, passion, and exemplary leadership as the center's founding executive director and an influential voice within the wider business ethics community. For his 42 years of service as a distinguished and dedicated member of the Bentley faculty and campus community, and for his great respect and regard accorded to him by an international network of business executives, ethics and compliance professionals, academic scholars and researchers, and business students. Therefore, be it resolved that the trustees and the president of Bentley University enthusiastically express their deep gratitude and esteem to W. Michael Hoffman and declare that henceforth the institute he established shall be named the W. Michael Hoffman Center for Business Ethics at Bentley University.